up this course where we're going to use the $18 and we a single loop control. And today's class is focusing on how we deal with multiple loops. So there's a, a little bit more that we have to learn. These slides are about to model and you can see here a little bit more that we need to learn. What we've learned with single loop control twice when we're dealing with multiple systems, but there's a little bit more complexity that we need to take care of. Um, we need to obviously provide the, the number of sensors that we need, the number of manipulated variables. Right? So in the single loop control, you always have one sensor and one manipulated variable. With multi loop control, we need to step that up a little bit. And then the, one of the hardest parts is deciding which manipulated variable is going to change which control variable and how we're going to pair that up. We'll see that that's not obvious. Uh, so, you'll have an example of that. So, let's take a look at that uh, pretty much through a series of examples. Now, before we get a little bit further here, yeah, just notice that there's two types of control systems when you're dealing with multiple choice. Here's an example. Here's a tank that we're controlling for several aspects of it. One is the flow into the tank is important. The level of the tank. And the level there is indicated with this diagram to be controlled by the flow of the output. So the flow coming in is being controlled. The flow of the output is also being controlled in order to manipulate the level. But we're interested in also controlling temperature. So the temperature is being controlled by changing the amount of heat exchange there. So three objectives there, level, flow, and temperature. And we can have three separate independent loops. So here's this loop for level, here's a very small, quick loop for flow, and here's a different loop, a single loop that manipulates the steam flow rate in order to adjust the temperature. So three separate loops. That's actually the way we're going to look at the control system in this, uh, next week. But there is a type of controller that you'll see, especially those of you that don't work for, say, Suncor, Hepa Canada, the big petroleum companies like to use these centralized controllers, where all the sensor inputs, flow, temperature, level, go into some computer system, and that computer system decides how to manipulate the valves. So it's not three separate control loops, it's one larger control loop. And this larger control loop takes care of all the complexity of what we'll see and call interaction. These loops interact with each other. So this is not an independent loop. I'll quickly prove this to you now. This loop does not work independently of this loop over here. And then the temperature loop may interact with other variables in the system. So when we have this interaction, centralized controllers can sometimes do a better job than what the multi-loop controller does. So we will often call the centralized control on the right and decentralized control on the left. This is a really interesting topic of centralized control. All the graduate students that you see up in JG370, TAs and so forth, that are doing the process systems, MACC research, a lot of their work is around what these centralized controls do. Okay, so, and we have some graduate courses on that. And 4E next year, if any of you take the 4E digital control course, Dr. Schwartz, but let's take a look at what the multi loop control does. The multi loop controller says, right, if I want to control this flow over here and I'm going to manipulate that valve position, I can have a PI controller or even a PID controller do that. So we have a KC, a TI, and a TD for that loop. And that's the KC, TI, and TD is fixed for that system. So if a set point change needs to be made here for flow, or a disturbance change occurs, the same KC, same TI, same TD takes care of those set point changes and disturbances in that loop. The separate loop down here for TC with a different KC, a different TI, and a different TD. These are not the same controller tunings because the manipulated variable on the here and the effect on the control variable are very different in this temperature loop and in the flow loop. Right? So if you did, remember how we decided to calculate KC, TI, TD, you make a step change in your MV and you observe your CV does something like that. So there's some sort of time delay theta, there's a time constant tau, and there's a KP here. 
If I do that change in this valve position, so if I open that valve by stepping out, and I'll observe a change over here. And if I go make a change here in the steam flow rate, I observe the change in temperature. Those two experiments will lead to very different faders, different towels, different cavities. The processes for each of those two loops are very different. So the controller tuning, KCTITV, that we need to use to control those loops effectively are different as well. Okay, so it's not surprising that we have different controller tunings for different types of systems. And then finally, the level control, the level control also has a different case. So multi-loop controller is exceptionally appealing. We like to do multi-loop controller because all the good stuff that we've learned in the past 11 weeks in this course can be simply applied independently without considering the other loops. So it's very easy now. We're, we're good at figuring out what our process looks like, theta, tau, and kp, and then using those tables to calculate KCTIT to be more comfortable with it. So we'd like to just keep doing that if possible. But let's take a look at some of the problems that show up. Take a look at this flow sheet here. It's a little bit messy. There's a lot going on there. It's, um, let's understand what's happening here. We've got a storage tank. We're pumping liquid from that tank through a valve V1. And we're measuring the temperature T1. And this liquid needs to be heated up before it enters the reactor. So here's my CSTR. Reactor. So I heat that stream with some hot oil. That hot oil comes in a T2, there's a valve position. And I can see that heat being increased by comparing T1 to T3. So I'm heating up my stream. There's a bit of a recycle coming back around. That recycle T9 blends up with T3, and I get a new temperature T4. That's the composite of T3 and T9. That blended stream goes into the CSTR. One thing that's of importance there is the level in the tank. We don't want to overflow the tank. That's an operational variable. And T5 is another variable. I'm interested in controlling T5. That's some desired value. That material reacts. We pump it out through a pump there. V5 gets measured. Hot oil again. We're heating the stream up at another time because we're about to go into a flash vessel. We're going to separate this stream. So we want to take it from liquid phase to almost at that boiling point phase, just where it's a liquid vapor mixture. And T7, so again, we heat from going from T6 to T7, there's heat added, and then we flash. What's a flash drum do? It separates liquids from vapor. Okay, so we get the material separating out there. The vapor phase leaves. We measure the pressure and the flow, and the vapor phase leaves out there. The liquid phase, Flash drum always has a liquid at the bottom. So flash drum is like a mini distillation column with one tray. That's all the flash drum is. Single tray distillation column. We measure the liquid that's sitting over <coughs> there. That's important to control. The last thing we want to do is send liquid up our vapor stream. Like we definitely don't want to send liquid up there, so controlling the level in that flash vessel is important. We pump it around and it gets recycled. <coughs> so lots going on there. Let's see, what can we control? <coughs> Level is important, pressure is important. You never want the pressure in this vessel to go beyond a certain amount, otherwise that's going to lead to an explosion of the vessel there. So P1 is important, L1 over there is important, T7 is important. Let's just take those three right there. There's a whole lot of other complexity on the flow sheet, but just take those three for now. What would you use to control the pressure? That's your control variable. What do you want? What should be the minimum variable for pressure? T7. How do you manipulate T7? T7 is not a manipulated variable. Okay, so B6. If we change B6, what's going to change? T7, for sure. Will T7 change if we change B6? Okay. So. Let's come back here. Let's come back to T1. Pressure needs to be controlled. What should be the manipulated here? Percent open of V8. Does it 
matter if you change percent open of V8? Will it affect P1? Why? But if I open V8, it's going to happen to P1. Is V8 a suitable manipulated variable for P1? Yeah. Okay. People often, uh, it's, a, it's a common misconception that you see the sensor before the valve and you think that if that variable is not going to be affected by the valve. So that the, the moment you open that valve, that flow will increase and that pressure will be relieved in the vessel. So P1 is a drop. So an MV that we might consider for P1 is the percent of V8. And that's a, that, it's a, um, a candidate for it. What can we use to control the level, L1, in this flash test? Percent from 6. Think what a flash drum is doing. level in a flash drop. Okay, so we've got three controlled variables. We're still going to to get to T7. We want to control T7 as well. OK, 
Okay, back to car examples. So you're driving a car and you want to control the speed at a certain value, 100 kilometers an hour. Your manipulated variable to do that is, let's be specific, what is the manipulated variable on a vehicle to control the speed? Angle of the gas pedal, which affects your percent open on the fuel. Okay, so percent open on the fuel is your manipulated variable, your controlled variable is your speed. So if we drew that feedback control loop, we can go here, speed set point, that's a number that you set. We're going to create a feedback controller here. GC1, let's call this. Now GC1 over here, that's a pretty complex controller. Okay, but let's say we're, we're designing a cruise control system. So GC1 could be a PID controller. And that PID controller is going to change the percent gas open. And then GP1 over there is the transfer function that tells me if I change the gas amount open, what happens to my speed. I'm going to feed this back. I'm going to feed it back the other way. Take it up here. So there's the feedback control loop for speed. If you were designing a cruise control system, perhaps, the percent gas opening would do that. Let's design another feedback controller. What other feedback control system exists in a vehicle? <coughs> Interior temperature of the car. Okay, let's take a look at that one. Into interior temperature. So you as the driver or the passenger, you set on the dial what you'd like the interior temperature to be. And the car might have a very simple control loop in there that uses that set point. It's called a GC2 now in that control loop. And it opens the percent opening of the vents. Get to allow some of the heat exchange to occur. And there's a transfer function there. It's called a GP2 that tells you what's going to happen to this interior temperature. So the internal temperature in the car will change when that valve vent opens. Okay, and we can feed that back in the regular way. Okay, so we've got two control loops in the car. Are these control loops independent of each other? We expect that if we change the speed of the car, the temperature inside the car is not going to vary. Right? Does that, that makes intuitive sense. Conversely, if we change the temperature inside the vehicle, the speed of the car is not going to change. So I already expect that these two loops are independent of each other. There's no interaction. There's no interaction between these loops. I can go and consider then there's two separate single loops on totally independent systems. If I design this controller GC1 over here, I don't have to really care about what the temperature of the car is on the inside. And conversely, if I design this controller that controls the car's interior temperature, I don't have to be concerned with what the speed of the car is. That's what independent loops mean. You can go design the control loops GC1 and GC2 totally separately from each other. Let's take a look now at a different example. We'll go back to a tank, CS2R system.
Let's consider the case where I've got my tag, CSTR, and I've got a heat exchanger in this tank. Now the level, the level of this tank is important as well to me because the heat exchanger coming in is partly submerged. So some of the heat exchange occurs when we've got material in contact with that coil. Some of the coil is outside the tank. So here's the desire to control level on that tank. So the level controller. And one way I've decided to control the level on this tank is to adjust the pump outlet valve. So I've got a valve out here and pumping. And the level can be controlled in that tank by manipulating the valve position. <coughs> to complete the picture, we also have the flow, some flow F coming into the tank. Now, the steam valve can be adjusted as well. And that's adjusted in order to control the temperature in the tank. So the temperature there can be manipulated by opening and closing that valve position. That will let more or less steam do that. <coughs> With that example so far, do those loops appear independent of each other? Yeah. 
Our intuition might be that that's a positive sign. Let's take a look now at the other loop. Well, sorry, let's first close this loop. So manipulating temperature by opening that valve, and then we've got a negative over there, positive in the visual. Let's consider the second loop, L, the level set point. We're going to need a lot of space between these two. So level set. My second controller that will control the level. And the output from that controller is percent open. that appear inside this transfer function block. And then you go ahead and you set the settings for that controller GC1. Now, if the loops are independent, what we've said so far is you can then go repeat that exercise, make a step change here in V2, 
observe the control variable to get kc theta and tau, sorry, kp theta and tau for that second transfer function, and then go calculate the controller tuning for gc. And if you had a third loop that's independent, you can just go repeat that over and over. So that's what true independence means. Let's see if these loops truly are independent. One way to check is, if you make a change in one of the manipulated variables, does it affect any of the other controlled variables? So if I open V1, if I make a change in that manipulated variable, V1, does it affect any of the other controlled variables? Does it affect the level? No. Okay, so one way we can indicate that is we can draw a transfer function over here. I'm going to call this GP21. Let's see why in a minute. And I can bring this transfer function in over here. Plus and plus. Okay, so if I open the bell V1, I'm asking, does it affect CV2 in any way? In other words, L, the level, is my second control variable. If the answer is no, then we know that this transfer function here is zero. If these two transfer, if these two systems are independent, the change in the first manipulated variable will not affect the second, the second control variable. Let's take a look at the other valve position. You already know the answer to this one. If you change V2, what's going to happen to the temperature? Follow this through, let's open, take V2, there's another transfer function we're going to call this GP12 this time, GP12, plus, and plus. So if we open that valve, L2, uh, sorry, V2, Open this valve here by the pump, what's going to happen in the tank? The level will drop. Is it going to affect the temperature in the tank? The level will drop, we've got less material exposed to the, the coils of the heat exchanger, less heat transfer occurring, T2 is going, T is going to drop as well. Okay, so this transfer function here is non-zero. Functions indicate that there's interaction in the system. Everyone clear on, on that distinction over there? I did a system over there on the, on the left with no interaction. You can tune those control loops, you can operate those loops totally separately. But the moment one control system interacts with the other control system, we say that there's interaction. Let's take a look at what the path of that interaction is. Okay, so this diagram can get messy now. Let's add, add a little bit more to it. You're ready to follow through. What happens if the operator makes a change in the level set point? They want the level to be a little bit higher in the tank. So we open this level set point up a bit. Let's say we started at steady state, we were at the low at this lower level, now we want to go to a higher level. This error signal is going to change. And we're going to go through GC2. We're going to go through GC2 and we're going to see this valve. We want the level to increase, what's going to happen to the valve? It's going to close. GP2. It moves through, and the level is going to go up. Okay. But it's also going to go up here. That valve closes, 
and pass through this type of function up there and the temperature. What's happened to the temperature? We close that valve in two. Temperature is going to rise. So this temperature rises, but T set hasn't changed. The T set is still where it was. That temperature is going to rise. We're going to start transmitting through this branch. Through GC1 is going to take some action. Temperature has risen, so what is V1 going to do? Close. We want to put a little bit less steam in there. We're going to circulate through that second loop. This, we miss this branch. That valve is now closed. We move through here. What is GP21? That was zero. Okay, so it stops over there. Okay. So definite interaction between those loops. We say interaction exists when we make a change in one of the loops and it affects the control variables of the other. <coughs> Back. We'll just give you a minute to take some of that down. I'll come back and make a little point to this. <laughs> we increase, we want the level to go up, so we ask the valve V2 to shut. And if the, we ask valve V2 to shut, we close this valve V2, the level starts to rise up, we've got more material in contact with the new shape. So our, our flow here, we, we said we're closing this valve. So what's happened to the residence time in the tank? More, more, more contact with the, with the material in the tank. Okay. Yeah, so these interactions are not obvious sometimes. We can't always predict from first principles point of view what's going to happen. The key, the key thing that you have to be able to predict is whether this is a zero or a non-zero. That's really all that does matter. I'm going to show you an easy way in Wednesday's class to check whether it goes up or down. But for now, all that you need to know is whether it's zero or non-zero. If they're zeros, if GP21 and GP12 are zero, then we say the systems are not interactive. If GP21 or GP12 have a non-zero there, we have to okay. So here's the important point. Why is this so important to understand? Well, let's take a look back at how we tune these controllers. When we tune the controllers, we said that if they're independent, we can step the manipulated variable, observe the control variable, and calculate kp, theta, and tau. But take a look here. Let's say I was tuning one of these loops, if I step the manipulated variable, the control variable gets affected not only by this manipulated variable, but it also gets some feedback coming from the other loop. Okay, so when you observe this CV, you're not seeing the independent CV from this MV. This is not a pure chain MV causes this CV. The other loop that you have there will come back at you. So you're not seeing the transfer function from this MV to the CV, and you're seeing the interaction between the two systems in addition to the change that you've made. So the key result we have to take from this is when you tune a multi-loop system, you have to tune both controllers at the same time. But there's no way around it. You can't tune one control loop and then tune the other. On a multi-loop system with interaction, you have to tune both loops at the same time. Uh, if both transfer functions in the middle there were non-zero, would it be like impossible to control it? 
But let's say they acted in different directions. So it changed in one, it changed the other, and then you try to correct and it would change the other again. So you never really. Yeah, you never count. Yeah. So we're going to look at some criteria for control there. Oops. So, yeah, that's a good point. Let's hold that for, for Wednesday or maybe Friday. Okay. So let's take a look at uh, one other example then now that we'll use then in, in Wednesday's class also. system where we're simply blending two streams. So blending happens in many, many chemical processes. We've got one stream here, let's call it fluorine of A and a concentration of A, A. And we've got another stream here, which is the solvent. We've got solvent stream. And this has a fluorate of S. And it has a concentration of A is zero. So A is some, some species that we're interested in. S is the solvent, and we're going to blend the species together. So this is pure, pure A. We're taking a pure stream of A. And we're blending it with a solvent. That solvent has no A in it. And there's two controlled variables here. CD1 that I'm interested in controlling is the combined flow, the mixture flow Fn. And we can call, let me just move this over a little bit. CD1 is Fm. The mixture flow rate is the sum of the pure stream plus the sum of the solvent stream, Fa plus Fs. Our second control variable that we're interested in, whenever we blend stuff, we're interested in the blend's concentration. C2 <coughs> is the blend concentration Xam. <coughs> That's the blend's concentration. And XAM is given to us by a nonlinear equation, in fact. Whereby a mass balance, we can say FM and XAM, the blend concentration, is equal to FA times Xa plus Fs times Xa in the solid stream. So simple mass balance on the inputs and the outputs. You can back calculate what Xam is, the blend's concentration. We have a little bit of a simplification here that XAS is zero. Okay, so let's try to draw one of these diagrams that we've just uh, been working with. But I, what I'm going to do is just focus on the interaction part. We're just going to look at this section here in the middle. When, when you change the valves, what happens to the control variables. In other words, I'm going to omit the feedback controllers. What we can do is we can call, call this my manipulated variable 1, and this is my manipulated variable 2. <coughs> Quick intuition. If I change manipulated variable 1, the valve on the stream of A, will it change Fm? Yes. Will it change the concentration of A in the mixture? Yes. yes. So this valve, B1, changes both CD1 and CD2. So 
So we've already got interaction, you know that. Let's see if we've got interaction from the other way around. If I open valve MV2, does it change the total flow of FM? Does it change the concentration of A in the blend? Oh, yes. If you change B2, does it change the concentration in the blend? Yes, it does. It dilutes it. Right, you're adding more solvent, so you're diluting it. So both inputs affect both outputs. So what does this, this look like? So both inputs affect both outputs. We can look at drawing this as follows. MV1, and here's my transfer function, the CV1. We call this the G11 transfer function. The first subscript refers to the output, the second subscript refers to the input. We also have that this input, MD1, we'll call this G21. G2 because it's going to affect the second output from the first input. So the 2 there refers to the output, and the 1 refers to the input. So the subscripts are always in output-input order. And that's going to affect my second input. Let's, let's draw that down here. Let's put MV2 over here. The second manipulated variable. We often just start with the G11 and G22. Just put our first and last one there. So G22 is my second transfer function. It tells me how CV2 changes when I make a change in MV2. And that manipulated variable, MV2, we said also affects G12. We're going to affect our first controlled variable when I make a change in my second manipulated variable. So G12. Okay, let's put this together then. If this gets a little bit messy, we'll bring this down. And we'll put plus signs over there so you think that's additive. And we'll bring this one up, pop over there, and a plus sign to indicate that it's added. Okay, so we're going to draw a lot of these diagrams this week with the four blocks and the crossing and everything. Okay, so we've already established, based on your intuition, that G12 and G21 are non zero. What we're going to do in next class is we're going to try and figure out just the steady state gains. So I was emphasizing what the gain is. We're going to try and build this in matrix form. We're going to find G11, G12, G21, and G22 when I have MV1 and MV2. So we're going to represent this next class in matrix form that tells me when I change my two inputs, MV1, MV2, what is the effect on the two outputs? What does that matrix look like when the systems do not interact? What does this middle matrix look like for systems that have no interaction? Only non-zeros on the diagonal. All the off diagonals are zero. We're going to look at that on the